everyone. Welcome to the dye room at the costume shop at the Santa Fe Opera. My name is Sherry Vasek. I'm the head of the dye department here, head dyer painter. And I'm really happy to be sharing some of my techniques with you today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about distressing and different techniques that we've used on productions in the past. Hi, we're here to talk about general work in the costume dye department and also specifically today about distressing, different levels of distressing and what that communicates about character and how it tells story. So I've, I've assembled some examples of some of the distressing work that we do here in the, at the opera and here are some examples of garments that suggest quite a bit of life lived by the characters in, who are wearing the costumes. So we've got examples of physical abrasion that have, have tell certain stories about what's happened to the characters and also a great deal of sort of ground in general dirt to the costumes. Um, you can see that there's a variety of levels of intensity here. And then there are also specific events that have happened to these characters. So mud splatters have happened here and um, sort of a wound, some kind of seeping out has happened in this one. And all of those things help to suggest what has occurred to the character through the process of the story. Um, most of these suggest some kind of long-lived um, aging and distressing. Um, there's also distressing that can suggest one single dramatic event, and that's an example here. This is a costume for Lucia, and in a fit of emotional distress, she murders her brother. So this began as a costume that was pristine. Nothing else untoward has happened to this character. And then suddenly this very violent event occurs. So in this case, we were tasked with creating the look of the blood splatter um, with specific areas that the designer had suggested she wanted blood placement to occur and specific instructions about how that should, the balance of that should be on the costume. So we did some sort of mapping of placement with um, a spatter technique and then very careful um, expanding of those areas that we had established. So even though it may look random or uh, sudden in the way that it was produced, it was actually done with a great deal of care, multiple steps, and careful um, arrangement of placement. So one of the things that you want to think about when you're doing distressing is the placement on the body, how the, the costume is being worn, what maybe the person has done uh, that's caused some of the distressed areas. So one of the obvious things is wherever somebody has sweated and then there's been dirt and grime that's, that's seeped into the costume in the sweat areas. So that's part of what's happened here and also in the center back here. Um, then you want to think about underarms, um, edges of costumes often get a, or edges of clothing often get a more wear and more dirt. Um, so that's another thing to think about. Um, and then uh, elbows are a thing to think about. So what matters is knowing where those part, spots are on the costume when it's worn by the particular person who's going to be wearing it, the particular performer. So I prefer to be able to go into fitting with the costume on the person and mark those key spots so exactly where the elbow is when it's flexed and then maybe some spots or uh, marks around there telling me sort of the general area that 
the elbow treatment is going to take up. Um, same thing with knees. So where that kneecap is and where that area is that you want to do. And the thing to think about is that, is the person kneeling into something? Okay, really, the impact area is below the kneecap. It's not centered on the kneecap. So that's a mistake that can be made where you end up with the distressed area actually being too high because of how the, the body functions and how the garment works on the body. Um, so that's the thing to remember. Um, so marking them with safety pins, once I get them out of the fitting, I may tra trace that, thread trace it, so that I don't have funny, lumpy safety pins to navigate around. Um, so those are all really important things to keep in mind. Try to get as much information from the designer about what they want as possible. But often what will happen is that you have to um, work into it and then get a response and then work into it again. So it's often a multi-step process. Whenever you work with a new product, or you need to refresh your memory about a product that you haven't worked with in a while, you should reference the material safety data sheets. They're no longer called material safety data sheets because there's been new legislation, and they're now safety data sheets, which have a great deal more information for you in them. Um, every company and school is required by law to have safety data sheets on every product that you work with. And what we do here is we keep an archive of everything in the dye shop that we work with. And what you'll find in the safety data sheet is information about um, the manufacturer, um, any contact information for um, if you have a safety problem with the product. Um, there's information about what kinds of effects that the product can possibly have on you. Um, so there are pictogram warnings about the product as well as verbal information about um, if it causes skin irritation, if it causes um, difficulty breathing or respiratory problems, if it is something that causes cancer. Uh, so there's a lot of information here about what the hazards potentially are. And other areas of information that are really important for you would be things about the composition of the product, if there's any specific hazards that are in it, if there's um, certain requirements in terms of handling the product. So um, information about what you should do if there's an accidental release of a lot of it or how you should store it in case it is something that will react with, with another chemical. And you need to keep those separate. Um, the, and there's also in section 8 a lot of information about um, controlling your exposures to the product, what you need to do in terms of personal protective equipment um, and, and ventilation issues. So all of that is really, really helpful and you need to look at that before you start working with the product. There's also information in later in the document about the stability of, of the product, if it breaks down. Um, that may help you know a little bit more about shelf life and how long you can store something reasonably. Um, there's toxicological information about how it could get into your body. Could you inhale it? Could it be absorbed through the skin? Um, could it be ingested? What are, what are the routes of entry that might be problems that you need to protect yourself against? And then you can make decisions about what kind of um, personal protective equipment you need to work with the product safely. There's also some information about um, 
ecological hazards if it gets into the environment. Um, so what you need to do to make sure that you're not causing problems in that way. So disposal issues would be something that you can find in this document as well. So um, it's really a valuable document and you need to keep these records. When I first download the information, the, the safety data sheet, um, what I do is I go through and um, mark the date that I um, got the information because one of the laws is that you need to maintain an updated uh, file of all your chemicals so after a couple of years you have to update your, your whole uh, binder of, of chemical information um, and there's also a rule about the disposal of any document that you um, have taken out of your archive. That has to be held in archive, I believe it's for 20 years, before you can actually dispose of it. When you're thinking about how you need to protect yourself um, from the products that you're working with, um, you're of course thinking about the conditions you're working in and uh, what you've gleaned from the safety data sheet. So, for example, um, if you're thinking about skin absorption and protecting your hands, um, there's a range of possible gloves that you might use depending on what you're be being potentially exposed to. Um, if it's a water-based uh, paint or something like that, that uh, you could use um, a glove like this. However, if it's a solvent-based paint or chemical, then you're going to be needing to use something that is going to protect you from um, solvents. So these are gloves that are chemically, chemically impervious gloves. And when I order these and get them in, I always put the year that we receive them so that we know how old they are and that way once they've kind of been in our stock for a while we can assess the condition and if they're too um, compromised then we get rid of them. So that's a helpful little practice to use with gloves, with um, actually the paints that you use as well is to mark the year on there. You don't want things hanging around for too long because uh, they can break down. Um, so then if it's a chemical and heat as well, I might use a glove like this. So your choice of glove is going to depend on the product, the temperature, um, the conditions you're working in, and you need to um, choose a glove accordingly. Likewise with respiratory protection, you might just need a dust mask for particulates, but if there's um, chemicals involved, vapors involved um, that are potentially hazardous, you need to figure out what those respiratory hazards are and you might use a respirator like this that gives you a great deal more protection. Likewise, you need to be thinking about hearing protection. Similarly, you might need to protect your eyes using some kind of a, a chemical splash goggle. And always you want to keep your PPE clean. I always clean my PPE immediately after every use and that's a good practice. And then as you might have noticed, once the um, PPE is clean and dry, then I store it in a plastic bag um, so that I'm protecting it. And I also write on my respirator cartridges how long I use this cartridge so that I have a good sense of when it maybe is going to be so full that it's not safe anymore to use and it needs to be replaced. So that's a good habit also. So far what we've talked about are ways of using personal protective equipment in uh, targeted ways having to do with where you might be being exposed, either through inhalation or skin absorption just on your hands. 
but there are times when your whole body might be exposed. An example would be when we spray flame retardant on whole groups of costumes. And the, so that means that the spray is everywhere in the air where we're working. So in that case, what we do is we use a, a Tyvek jumpsuit like this. It's got a hood, it's got, completely covers your feet. So it is uh, completely covering you head to toe other than just where your face is. And of course, you've got a respirator on there and you've got goggles on there. So you're covered head to toe and you have your gloves naturally. Uh, so that's what we use when we're in an environment where there's a lot of uh, a toxic product that we need to protect ourselves. This is a wet on wet technique that we'll be doing. I'm using uh, Jacquard Dynaflow. One of the things that I like to do with that product, especially when I'm working wet, is to add a little bit of this Jacquard, Jacquard product, which is called uh, Airfix. You just put a couple of drops into what you're working with, and that's going to help with the color fastness of your product. So that's an important thing to remember when you are thinking about the distressing process, how long it's going to take, and when costumes can go into usage, because many products require not only heat setting, but also a particular amount of cure time before they can be, the garments can be washed. So all that has to be calculated into what you're doing. With this technique, we're working wet on wet. I am going to spray in to the areas that I plan to paint. Some of that spraying in I've already done, um, but it's just to dampen down areas that I'm going to work in. And I'm using the natural flow of the paint into those dampened areas to let it spread. So I don't have to do very much other than let the brush touch where, I'm, where I want things to be discolored. And, and the, the water will do a lot of the work for me. So I really like working with multiple colors. I think that that gives more depth to what you do. So we're laying in some browns right now. I am dragging the brush up a little bit into the wet area. And one of the things that can happen with this process, if you've got the garment too wet, a lot of your paint will just drip right out onto the floor. <laughs> so you do have to kind of judge that. That area, I didn't want a brush mark, so I kind of am helping it with my thumb to um, make a more organic kind of color placement. That looks real obviously brush strokey, doesn't it? So let's fix that. And another thing we can do to fix that is to spray into here and let some water help us. So that is now working much better. Uh, an area that you might think about is buttonholes. Buttonholes can sometimes get more wear and, wear and finger grime and stuff like that. It's such pleasant things we think about when we're distressing. What's the finger grime doing? And let's get some collar to have in here. Okay. You want to think about is the garment being worn with with the shirt buttoned all the way up? Are we going to see the inside of the collar? What's going to happen there? So um, distressing all the areas that we potentially would see. This is hideously ugly, I'm going to fix that. And the other thing I want to do in this collar area 
is introduce a little thing, a little bit of sort of a yellowish green. It's a little closer to a sweat color because that's going to help us too. Okay. I want to get back in there with a little more brown. That's. I'm trying to. Um, not create brush marks by using the side of the brush. I'm going to carry this all the way down because sometimes that inner edge is good to get. So I would continue with that process in all the areas that I'm interested in. Um, cuffs, elbows, all the way around the bottom edge of the of the shirt, maybe a little bit of a of edge treatment to this cup um, to this pocket as well. So there are a lot of different tools that can be useful in doing a textured physical distressing of fabrics. Uh, most of them are commonly available at hardware stores. Anything that can scratch and abrade can be useful. So cheese graters are a possibility, although I find that the shape is a little difficult to work with and a hand tool is easier to work with. So this is one that I like a lot. Um, it's a sure form shaver. It's really meant for wood and other products like that, but it works beautifully on fabrics. So that's a good option. Um, various kinds of wire brushes are possibilities. Uh, different kinds of, of combs that might be used for... Um, who knows what those are for? I don't know what those are for, but curry combs can work. Um, different things that are meant to pull fibers apart or straighten fibers can be helpful. Usually wire. Um, materials for them to be made out of. Um, some of these we've had for decades here at the Opera, so I really don't know the history of where they came from. Um, this is another one of a shaver that's similar to the handheld one. Um, it can be useful on larger areas, particularly if you've stabilized the area somehow, like maybe uh, pinned it to a table or something. So those are all options um, for really pulling the fibers apart. Sometimes all you want is to kind of um, make the, the fabric more tired, and so sandpaper can be really helpful for that. It's also super great on leather to try to, to break down the sheen on, on leather. Uh, so that's another option. Another thing I want to tell you about is um, doing a wash and chemical process. So sometimes once you get the fabric roughed up a little bit with your, your hand tools, then you can put all of that in the wash. So we, we use a, a three-part combination of um, washing soda, laundry detergent, and dishwashing powder. And those are in e even increments. Okay, so now we're going to look at different ways that you can pad out parts of the costume prior to distressing to achieve a more um, accurate look on the final result. So uh, most of what we use are things that are very rudimentary that you can make anywhere. So these are legs that we've created using newspaper um, and then covered in several layers of plastic, dry cleaning bags. And the lovely thing about these are that they're very flexible, so we can create elbow shapes, we can create knee shapes, and if we really want uh, to exaggerate that knee or elbow area, we can use something like this, which is 
just a wad of several plastic bags inside a plastic shopping bag. And I could tape that onto this knee area, or I could just stuff the stuff all of this into the costume and then um, adjust it once I've got it inside the costume. So those are really fabulous, super easy to make, and very, very useful in the distressing process. Um, here I've got a couple of arm shapes that I've created out of um, rolled towels and then wrapped in several layers of plastic and tape. So those are really useful as well. Those could be like a lower arm shape that I can then attach to fabric or cord and I can adjust it and manipulate it so that I'm creating an elbow crease. So those are really helpful and we're going to make one of those right now. These are, I've already sort of pre-set up a, um, a tapered shape here, which is a little different than what you see here. So I'm thinking of this as the uh, upper arm and the sort of shoulder area, which it gets bigger up in this, this part of the arm. And I'm thinking of this as the lower arm so that I can create an entire arm shape that I can adjust and, and move. Okay, so I just need one more layer of toweling to kind of hold all of this together. And then I'm going to tape it. I'm sorry, I'm going to first safety pin the layers of toweling together just to hold them. Then we'll put it into some plastic, and then we'll tape it. We use a lot of plastic in this work just to, so that we're controlling where the moisture is going and where it isn't going, and that's hugely important. Okay, so there's that. I'm going to tape it a little bit that. And then I'm going to use this heavier plastic bag for the last layer because it'll be really great to pin into. to take things apart and reconfigure them if you need to. All right, that's ready to put on the dress form now. When we're working with distressing, of garments, we try to recreate the body underneath as best as possible. With this dress form, I've created a yoke of fabric on which to suspend stuffed arms to try to fill out the garment in order to distress it more accurately. Our sleeve, uh, upper arm, ready to go onto the dress form. You'll notice that I have a strip of muslin here, which I'm going to use to help attach everything together. And it is attached to a muslin yoke, which helps just stabilize everything, keep everything centered on the body. I'm just going to safety pin this on. And then when I dress the garment onto the dress form, I'm 
I slide in the muslin first and then the upper arm area. And get all of that up onto the shoulder of the dress form. Once I've got everything in place, then I can start positioning this. I would usually center the garment on the dress form and then make sure that my upper arm areas are really fully up into the garment. Now that I've got that placed, I'll take this section that we saw before, it's the, what we're imagining to be the lower arm, and then I'm able to position all of that so that it's accurate relative to the way the garment's cut. You can really see in this sleeve shape where that elbow is meant to be. You can see this curve of that. So I know where I need to put everything. So that allows me to get a lot of lovely elbow wrinkles into the sleeve prior to distressing. And I am just going to stabilize that so that everything is maintaining its position and is secure relative to this lower arm element. And now that I've got that position the way I want it, then I can tape all of this to the sleeve, or to the arm. And now I'm pretty confident that that's going to hold where I want it to. And now I can position that relative to the dress form. And I've got something where I can now go in and I can paint into these creases and get some really lovely effects. There are a couple of reasons that this particular technique is helpful. One is to introduce texture and wrinkles into the garment. And if I were going to do that, what I would do is I would spray this whole area with a vinegar water solution. I might even close pin some of these wrinkles so that they're very distinct and then I would leave it overnight and see what I get in the way of sort of permanent set in elbow wrinkles. So that's one way that you can use this idea. Another way you can use this idea is to paint into the depths of the folds here to get just a little bit more um, depth and differentiation there. So that's what we're going to do right now. We're using the same paints and colors that we were using in other parts of, of the work on these uniforms. So I just am going to find the depth of that fold and then I'm going to work my way up that fold so that there's more darkness in the, in the little valley than there is on the hilltops. So that's, that just helps give a little more depth there.
And another um, way that this is useful, because I know where my elbow is, is that I can paint into the, the elbow area as if someone has maybe rested their elbows into the dirt. You could spray this as well as brushing. Either way works. The advantage to working on the form is knowing kind of where that is on the body. And again, as we talked about, we would have marked it in fitting and thread traced it or something like that so that we could use a technique like this where I'm really pulling the fabric and I wouldn't be trying to avoid problematic safety pin positions. So, so the thread tracing is helpful. So we're going to work on this jacket. We're going to be uh, addressing these seam allowances that have appeared since this garment was um, altered for a rental. And you can see here two seams where I've not done anything at all. And then two seams where I have done some work. This has two layers of um, painting into. So we're getting close to uh, a completion on this. There's a little more work I want to do here. Um, this is developing nicely. We're getting some of the value uh, variation uh, reduced in this area. What I'm trying to do with all of this is to obviously eliminate this quite obvious um, seam allowance. And I'm also trying to lose this very strong value contrast here while trying to maintain the uh, hue variation and the value variation that's happening in the distressing in the body of the jacket. So we're trying to make all of that work together so that we don't have it chopped up so much. Uh, the original paint that was used for these, uh, for the distressing on these jackets, um, that was five years ago. That product is now um, a little bit old in terms of shelf life. So I have chosen to use a different product for, the, for this um, work to, today. This is a pro chemical and dye product. Uh, it comes in both a transparent paint and an opaque paint. Um, in this case, I'm trying to work with a, a transparent because really the work that's being done here has a kind of a watercolor quality to it. So I don't want too much opacity to the paint. So this is a, a lovely product to work with. I've pre-mixed some colors that are very close to the colors that were used in the original project. So some reds, some greens, some grays and browns. And I'm gonna be mixing those colors in the process of doing this work. So it, it, it maintains the kind of irregularity that we had in the original garment. I'm working fairly wet because I don't want too much opacity in what I'm doing. Um, and I'm trying to keep my brushwork pretty light and pretty controlled in terms of where it's the placement is so that I don't get too much color buildup crossing over this line because that'll actually draw too much attention to what has happened here. So this is kind of a, in a way, a dry brush technique just to get some darker value to happen. And I'm trying to bring the value from where the original seam line was towards 
the new seam line. And you really kind of have to sneak up on this because you can take it too far really easily. I'm going to try to work a little bit of water in there to help the paint go into the fibers. And then I'm going to kind of work it in with my hand as well. When you're doing something like this, you really have to respond to what's happening in the fabric as you're working. Much of this technique, in terms of the original application, was sprayed into. And so trying to have a targeted area that replicates that look is it's really difficult to do that with spray. So I'm, I'm using a different technique altogether to try to live with what was done before. So now I've got some value variation that's happening nicely there, but I've got, I've got to try to bring in some other colors. So I see kind of a slightly more greenish area here. I'm going to try to introduce a little of that. And another thing that I've found really effective here is um, when I'm introducing some color in this region, if I bring a little bit of it out into the body of the of the coat, that helps also. I think I need a little bit more color on my brush though for that. One of the things we'll need to do is just wait for this to dry to make sure what how this is working in the fabric. When we originally did this work, there was um, so much paint that got soaked up into the fabric and we really had to do three or four layers to really get the final color on the outside of the garment to work. So this is going to be a multi-step process to try to reconstruct that. I'm going to go back in here and start with my grays again. And I also am really working into the seam itself, just to make sure that we don't have a light value there that doesn't make sense. So I'm seeing a lot more green in this region. So I'm going to try to bring that in here also.
think I'm going to introduce a little brown in there as well. I'm just going to bring this in really lightly because there's not a lot of brown in the original, but there's just a little bit. And so I'm going to let that be an underlayer that I then bring some gray up on top of. Normally, when I would be doing some work like this, I would, and it's part of the regular season, I would have fabric scraps to work with to see what the paint was going to do on the fabric. And since this is a garment from five seasons ago, I don't really have access to original scraps. So I'm using muslin, a piece of muslin, just to see how the paint is handling, you know, how wet it is, if I need to add more water, that kind of thing. Um, and I can use just a wet brush with water to help, and then scrubbing to help force color into the fiber. Okay, so that's a good first layer on this seam. And then we'll let it dry and see what has happened once it dries. Sometimes the, the paint goes right into the fiber and we lose a lot of what's on the surface and we have to rework it. So we'll just see how, what we need to do as a next step. So here are our three seam areas that we worked on earlier. We've got some variation of color in there and we've adjusted the hue so that it's not so obvious. However, this is just a first step and we'll go back in and add more to try to get that to be even less visible. Thank you so much for watching this little video. Um, that concludes what I wanted to share with you about
costume distressing. I hope that you have enjoyed some of these techniques and will be able to find ways to use them yourselves. And thank you so much.